We've all been gathered here for one thing today, and that's to find faith. Oh, my baby bag. We gotta find her. Can you imagine living next to a cold-blooded murderer? A community in South Carolina never thought that this was possible until a little girl mysteriously vanished. We have to keep thinking that they're gonna find her. Yes. We're just waiting on them to do it. And as the police combed through the neighborhood trying to find her, they failed to realize that there was something hidden right under their noses. Let's dive in. Faye Marie Swetlick was born on June 13, 2013, to her mom, Selena Collins, and dad, Chad Swetlick. Her mom and dad were not together, so Faye lived with her mom in the Churchill Heights neighborhood, South Carolina, while her dad lived in Rowan County, North Carolina. Faye was described as a bubbly, energetic, and outgoing little girl, with the prettiest blue eyes you'll ever see. She was super friendly and was always talking and complimenting everyone she met. Faye loved dresses, fancy shoes, collecting rocks, and playing outside. She was always smiling and would brighten up any room she walked into. <laughs> yeah, she was the epitome of that childlike energy that everybody just wishes that they had from the moment that she woke up in, in the morning to the moment that she laid her head down at night. It was go, 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 go. She very rarely even ever stop to eat. When this really heartbreaking incident happened, Faye was a first grader at Springdale Elementary School, where she was loved by both her teachers and classmates. On Monday, February 10th, 2020, Faye came home from school at around 2.45 p.m. The CCTV camera in the school bus captured her getting off the school bus near her home. She was wearing a black shirt that had the word peace written on it and her strawberry blonde hair falling around her shoulders. <sighs> Faye's mom, Selena, was at home at that time and she said that Faye dropped her school bag, grabbed a snack, and went to play in the front yard. That was the last time Faye would ever be seen alive again. At around 3.45 p.m., Selena went outside to check on her daughter and was concerned when she couldn't find her. She went around the neighborhood and called the parents of all of Faye's friends, asking if anyone had seen her little girl, but no one had seen her. Worried that something bad might have happened to her daughter, Selena called 911 and reported that her daughter was missing. In the call, you could hear Selena gasping and having trouble to speak as the operator asks what her emergency is. Oh, I can't. We can't find my daughter. She was playing outside, and no one could find her. I, 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 I have okay, to go she? she is sick. She's going to be okay. seven in June. At the time of the call, Selena said that her daughter had been missing for about an hour. She had tried looking everywhere for her, but couldn't find her. After taking all the details, the dispatcher asked Selena to wait outside while they sent an officer with a K-9 unit to help in the search. A short while later, more than 40 officers arrived at the scene, and they canvassed the neighborhood, knocking on every door and stopping anyone coming in and out of the neighborhood. They sent out a missing persons flyer on their social media accounts and to all local media stations, asking anyone with information to come forward and urging everyone in the area to check their CCTV footage and doorbell apps for video footage of the little girl. We've all been gathered here for one thing today, and that's to find Faye. The last time Faye was seen, she was wearing a black shirt with the word peace across the front of it. The photos that you have, her hair is a little bit longer uh, than it is today. We're trying to get pictures of that, but it's been cut to about shoulder length or just above. At this time, the authorities were operating under the assumption that Faye might have just wandered off and was lost somewhere in the woods or at a neighbor's house. And since there was no evidence of foul play or anything to suggest that she had been abducted, the case did not qualify for an Amber Alert. An Amber Alert is usually issued when law enforcement believes that an abduction had occurred and that the child was in imminent danger of serious bodily injury or death. The search for Faye continued, with over 200 officers going door to door and scouring through the woods and local landfills for any sign of the little girl. They used Faye's favorite toys for the search dogs to try and get her scent, but they came out empty. 
The next day, the situation became even more desperate, and more law enforcement agencies, including the FBI, were called in to help. Faye was entered into the FBI's National Crime Information Center database, and her home was declared a crime scene, and everyone was treated as a suspect. We want to make sure that everyone understands that despite the fact they might have gotten a knock on their door yesterday, they very likely will receive a knock on their door today. And that will include a series of questions that will uh, help us again in our work as we move forward in our investigation. Selena and her boyfriend, Carter Arkend, were interviewed separately as investigators tried to figure out if they knew more than they were telling. But their stories checked out and they were both ruled out as suspects. The FBI also talked to Faye's biological dad, Chad, to see if he might have been involved in his daughter's disappearance. They searched the house and checked through his phone records for clues, but found nothing suspicious. So he was also ruled out. Everyone in the neighborhood was interrogated and their homes searched, but still, investigators found nothing. On Wednesday, February 12th, the law enforcement told the media that they were leaving no stone unturned and expanded the radius of their search well beyond the boundaries of her neighborhood. They also asked the public for videos and tips that would help locate the young girl. Meanwhile, family, friends, and neighbors gathered in the church to light candles and pray for Faye's safe return. Oh, my baby bag. We gotta find her. We're worried, of course, very distraught, but we're only thinking positive thoughts. We have to keep thinking that they're gonna find her. We're just waiting on them to do it. On Thursday, February 13th, after three days of searching, the news that everyone had been dreading came in. Faye's body had been found, buried in the woods near her home. It is with extremely heavy hearts that we are announcing that we have found a body that the coroner has, has identified as Faye Marine Sweat. We are now treating this case as a homicide. As this community has been working hard to find Faye and bring her home safely, we wanted you to know as soon as possible. Autopsy results found that Faye had been suffocated with a trash bag a few hours after she went missing, and that her death had not occurred in the place where her body was discovered. After this tragic announcement, Officers also announced that a man was also found dead in the neighborhood and that they were just beginning to investigate the case. <sighs> Faye's tragic ending shocked everyone in the community, with parents worried that there was some maniac going around hurting young girls. Everybody needs to look out for each other's children. There's too many getting gone you know, at, at such a young age. And even though I didn't know this little girl, I have three grandkids of my own. And it just touches home, you know? Get to know your neighbors, get to walk around. That's it, God bless that angel. Hundreds of people gathered at the entrance of the neighborhood for a candlelit vigil for Faye and brought flowers, balloons, and teddy bears in honor of the little girl. Her body was taken to the funeral home in a police motorcade with her pink bicycle leading on a pink tow truck. The question in everybody's mind was who could have done such an awful thing and why? They were shocked to learn that the cold-blooded killer was actually one of them, a 30-year-old guy by the name of Cody Scott Taylor. According to his Facebook profile, Cody graduated from Bluffton High School in 2007 and then went to study math at the University of South Carolina. He, however, dropped out before he could graduate and took a job as a manager at Jimmy John's in 2011. Those who knew Cody described him as a loner who constantly had a negative outlook on life and lived without hope. He was scared of talking to women and identified himself as an incel and as asexual. An incel is a member of an online subculture of young men who consider themselves unable to get a romantic partner despite desiring one. A on the other hand, is a person who is not romantically attracted to anyone. 
Cody lived in Piccadilly Square townhomes, just 150 yards from where Faye lived. He had no previous criminal record and was actually not a person of interest when Faye disappeared. When the police were conducting the door-to-door -door searches, they actually talked to Cody on two different occasions and searched his apartment but did not find anything. In fact, the police said that he was cooperative and did not seem to be hiding anything. The first time that the officers searched Cody's apartment was two days after Faye's disappearance. Cody was not home at that time, but his roommates gave them permission. While they were searching, they noticed a full black laundry bag, but did not think much of it. Once Cody got home that day, the officers came back to interview him and he claimed that he was asleep when Faye went missing. The officers did not have a reason to doubt him. On Thursday, February 13th, officers decided to check the trash bins throughout the neighborhood for clues. And that's when they came across a pair of polka dot rain boots that matched the ones Faye was last seen wearing. The boots were in a trash bin outside Cody's apartment. The police also found a soup ladle with fresh dirt hidden in the trash bag. This alarming discovery led investigators to the nearby woods where they found Faye's remains buried in a shallow grave. Around the same time, some officers responded to reports of a man on the back of a patio in a nearby house. The man turned out to be Cody. The officers found him deceased with a lodged in his neck from a self-inflicted wound. When the police searched his apartment this time around, they found evidence linking him to Faye's death and burial. On the table in his bedroom, they found Faye's missing persons poster a Walmart receipt which contained a list of gardening items that Cody had bought in the early morning before Faye's body was found. The items include a garden towel, potting soil, and fertilizer. Some of this potting soil was found in the place where Faye was buried. Investigators also collected a series of surveillance videos around the neighborhood that showed Cody doing some really suspicious things in the woods before Faye's body was discovered. At 7.24 a.m. in that video, you will see a dark, hooded figure coming from the area of Cody Taylor's apartment. It's zoomed in. You will see him carrying a bag with what looks to be potting soil and fertilizer that was purchased from Walmart. The police also talked to the rideshare driver that had picked Cody up from Walmart, and he said that Cody appeared nervous when he asked him about Faye's case. They knew they were passing through the neighborhood and the driver saw the police and press and asked Cody if he knew the missing girl. Cody allegedly started acting nervous and tried to change the subject saying something like, I don't know, I never met her before. The police also found trash bags in Cody's room that matched the ones used to Kate Faye and a full laundry bag that contained Faye's DNA. Police suspected that Cody had hidden Faye in the laundry bag for two days before burying her in the woods. <sighs> Cody's roommate told investigators that Cody started acting suspicious as the search for Faye intensified. The roommate had started noticing some weird smell throughout the apartment, but didn't really know what it was since he never imagined that his roommate could be hiding a body in their house. Cody started using a deodorizing spray in the house around this time, and the roommate thought that he was just trying to mask the smell of a certain smoke. The roommate told the police that Cody would not let anyone near his room, and he started locking it even while he was around the house. He describes Cody as weak and said that he never would have committed such a horrible crime unless he had people in his incel community encouraging him to do it. However, when investigators checked Cody's phone and computer, they could not find anything to suggest that anyone else was involved in the crime. Still, the police could not determine why Cody did what he did as there was no connection between him and Faye's family other than being neighbors. A year after this tragic loss, the Churchill Heights community was still trying to process why everything happened the way it did. They came together to pay tribute to the little girl who loved everything and everyone. They set up a pink memorial bench in three different locations around the town, including a local park. Faye's parents said that they hope that everyone will not focus on how Faye died, but rather on how she lived with a smile, love, and compassion for others. She never really wanted anybody to be sad or to be upset or down. So a lot of trying to keep everything alive with Faye and her legacy is to try to be as happy as possible or if we are unable to be happy ourselves to try to make somebody else happy. What do you think about this case? What do you think was Cody's motive? Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section. And if you liked it, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe.